Bibles tonight, go ahead and take them out and turn to the book of Proverbs chapter 2. So we're in our second, second study in the book of Proverbs, and we're calling this book Life Skills. So as we uh, go through the book, we're learning how to apply God's truth to real life situations. How many here tonight would say they'd really like to know better what to do in given situations, how to do it? You wish you had more of God's leading, God's direction, God's insight, and God's wisdom. We need that, don't we? Solomon, who wrote this book, he needed that. In fact, he prayed, Lord, in 1 uh, Kings chapter 3, he said, Lord, give me a hearing heart. Give me a heart that understands you so that I could basically do my job better, fulfill my calling. And we all need to hear from God and be able to know the mind of God and the heart of God in situations. And really in the Bible, this is what the Bible refers to as our, our walk. When the Bible talks about our walk, it's talking about our life, how we live our life, what we do in life. And in that walk, then we are presented two ways, two paths, two um, understandings. And the Bible says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end of that way is destruction. So we don't want that way, right? But God's way is perfect, the Bible says. Do we want that way? So we want to walk in that way, don't we? Very interesting. So as we uh, transition from chapter 1 to chapter 2, Solomon then, he puts a lot of the burden on the seeker or the listener. He puts a lot of responsibility, in other words, in regards to wisdom on us. Watch what he says. This is great. So in verse 2, and by the way, we have communion tonight, so be ready for that. So watch what he says. Verse 1, chapter 2, he says, My son, if, so it's conditional, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you, so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. So, First, we have to understand the, the importance of wisdom. It's good to ask ourselves at this point, how much do I value wisdom? How important is wisdom? Is God's wisdom? How important that is, is that to me? If we understand what God says about wisdom correctly, we would understand that in life, wisdom is the principal thing or the primary thing. In other words, to live a godly life, to walk with God, to avoid that other path that leads to destruction, then we're going to have to walk or live out a way where we have to make decisions. We have to make constant decisions. And to make constant decisions the right way, we're going to need to know what God says. And not everything to us let me make that clear. Not everything to us is black and white. To God it is. But not everything to us is. A lot of times we don't know. A lot of times we, we hear about, there's a lot of, these are, this isn't the gray area. There's like 50 shades of gray right here. And stay out of the gray areas. I don't care what shade it is. <laughs> All the shades of gray are, are bad because we want to be in God's good graces. We want to be in God's way. And in God's way, there's, there's no confusion. God's not confused, is he? He's not like, oh man, this, this one's tough to figure out. I didn't think about this one. God's not like that. We're like that. So we need to connect, tune in, get the mind of Christ. So we have to ask yourself, how important is wisdom? Did you notice the words here that he uses in regards to wisdom as he puts the burden 
on us to be wise. He says, again, he says to receive my words. That, be, that word means to take them in graciously. What, what it means is, or in other words, he's saying that we have to have a, a right attitude towards God where we realize what he's saying to us are words of life. How, how do, we, do we listen to somebody who knows giving us the most valuable words of life? How, do, how are we to listen to that? That's what he's saying. Receive them graciously. Receive them with an attitude of like, wow, you're telling me that? Wow, you're showing me that? That is, that is amazing because now we're learning how to live life from the one who's given life, who's uh, holding together life and who's directing life. So he says that we can know how to do life right. But he says we, we have to have an attitude of receiving his words. And then he says to treasure his commands within you, which, which means to, to store up, to um, inventory, if you will, to stock up on. So now going from receive my words to treasure my words, it's, he's going up in an increment. He's saying now there's, there's even more value than receiving, thankfully, understanding that these words are coming from God himself to you in order to help you be successful in life. But now he says to, to store these words within you. Does that you, remind you of a scripture in Psalm 119, 11, Your word I have hidden in my heart so they might not sin against you. There's something very definite, very clear, very important about the receiving of God's word within us, storing it up in the way of keeping us away from sin. So if we're going to value wisdom, then we have to understand that valuing wisdom is going to also mean that we don't want to sin. That we realize and understand wisdom is to keep us away from sin, which is so destructive and hurtful. But see, if we don't think sin's that big of a deal, or we minimize sin, or just kind of think, well, sin's not that damaging, then we're not going to value wisdom. We're not going to value our walk with God. And we're not going to value the importance of being fruitful in our life for the kingdom of God. So, so he says, take these things in. I want you to notice something here. This is very important. To take in the words, there's an external factor which has to reach an internal factor. What I'm saying is, it all comes down to the heart. Okay, you and I can sit here and take in the word, we can hear it, and it can actually have zero effect on us. Actually, it could be damaging to us because we're responsible for it. If our heart is not soft, moldable, pliable, wanting to put that word into practice practically in our life. That's why he says we have to store the word within us, that the word is a transforming agent to a soft heart, that it changes us. Now, as he says that, he says in verse 2, then he keeps piling these words on to get us to understand that our approach to God has to be an, an approach where we value Him and we value what He gives us so much above everything else. We value that so much that we put our whole heart into it, our, our energy into it. We put our mind, our soul, our strength, our attentiveness. And, and you know what he's saying? As we go through this, 
he's saying the, the things of wisdom, God's not going to reveal those to the insincere, lackadaisical seeker, to the one who's flippant, lazy, complacent, lukewarm. He's saying that that person will never be wise. Because the wisdom of God is hidden in such a way where the true seeker will find it when they diligently seek him. So we have to ask ourselves another question, don't we? What's my approach to God? Do I approach school or my hobbies or my work or earning money or being popular, or dressing good, or looking pretty or handsome. Am I dressing, putting more into that than I am seeking the most important thing? And that's why Jesus himself said in Matthew 6, Seek ye first the kingdom. We can't play around with that. It's easy just, just to miss that. And it's also easy to think just sitting here is enough. It's easy just being here is enough. How many of us have gone to the gym and sat there the whole time and lost weight? <laughs> and we can't figure it out. I'm, I'm going to the gym every day. See, when you read through the Psalms, and then you start to read this, and then you start to read it in the New Testament, you look at the top, there is, a, there is an inclination, there is a wholeheartedness, there is a priority, there is a desperation, there is an urgency, there is a value, there, there is a, even with Paul, they said, man, he's, he's the madman because he's so into the word. He's, he's, he must have gone crazy. And we think if we attend two services a week, we think, wow, we're really extra credit people. <laughs> but see, it's not just about attending a service. It's about wanting to know God passionately. We have to really ask ourselves, is that what we really want? Because there's a, a lot of uh, attractions that are set up that we can go and plug in to the machinery of the organization of a church and not connect with God at all. Did you know that? So you can go to a church and you can tithe and you can find a ministry to serve in and you can do all this stuff. And now you're in the machinery and the whole time you're not connecting with God whatsoever. Remember, it's not about all the external stuff we're doing. It's about knowing him personally. And to do that, we have to be driven to do that. There's a time where Jesus, it was said about his, some of his followers, that he didn't commit to them because he knew their heart. Because they weren't there to really know him. They were there because of the stuff he did that was, they thought was really interesting and neat. So they wanted to follow him. Maybe if we follow him today, he'll heal a leper. That would be cool. And maybe if we follow him today, he'll raise somebody. That... But they never wanted to passionately know him. So we need to ask ourselves a question, that question and be really honest with ourselves. Is that my life's ambition? Is that my life's passion? And that's where it all starts. When that is my life ambition and passion, hold on to your horses strap in because you're about to go on the most amazing crazy ride by faith that you could ever hope for and imagine god's like that he's just like that he likes to dazzle us he likes to wow us he likes to put us in awe of him he doesn't want us to be in a ritual or routine he wants us to be in awe of him. Big difference, right? So that's why he says in verse 2, he says, incline your ear. That means to turn into, to pay attention to, to, to 
put your ear in, in a position to where you can hear from God. And then he says, and then apply your heart to understanding. So two things. So the, the ear and the heart, are, uh, heart. And then he says to uh, apply it. So that means just like us, if we're, there's something we really want to do or accomplish, we, what do we do? We really apply ourselves to that. We put ourselves into it. That's what we do. He says, uh, put yourself into it. And then he says in verse 3, he says, yes, if you cry out for discernment and you lift up your voice for understanding. So now he piles on a little bit more. And he says, this is something that we, we should cry out for and that we should lift our voice for. So he's just adding more of our involvement. Huge responsibility, right? Do you see that? The responsibility that he puts on the hearer, the responsibility he puts on the seeker, he puts a great responsibility. Because these are, these are holy things. These are God things. And the Bible says that God doesn't cast his pearls to swine. And in other words, he's not going to give his good stuff to people who are going to abuse it and neglect it and people who aren't serious about it. So the Bible presents a much different picture a lot of times in, than we will find in the everyday average American church. A different picture. So then look at this in verse 4. And these are all, notice these all, are all conditional. He says, if you seek her as silver and you search for her as hidden treasures, that word seek has within it a persevering factor. So we need to be persevering in our seeking of the good things of God. That means we, we have to keep going with it. That means we can't get... Um, sidetracked easily or we can't get discouraged easily it's in other words we you know we get up maybe one morning and we have a a little devotion and and then the next day we're tired and we say well yeah that was good yesterday but i'm kind of over that this is going to involve like anything in life this is going to involve sacrifice it's going to involve maybe putting away our social media, putting away our entertainment, putting away our technology. This is going to require maybe a huge paradigm shift for some people. But then again, we have to ask ourselves, what do we value more? You know, I think what really happens a lot of times is that we'll say we value the things of God, we value wisdom, we say that. And in our minds, we think we do that. But then practically, the way we live our life out is to show that we really don't value that. But then we, th we think, we sort of trick ourselves to think that, well, it's not that big of a deal. It's not that important. But if, if, when we think that, you might want to just circle or highlight this. Because this is intense. This is, this is God saying, you, you better be after it. But here's the good thing. Here's the good news. That, that God is a revealer of himself. He wants us to know him. But he also understands how important it is for us to have the right heart in knowing him. And so he doesn't make it uh, such that it, we can just find him without putting ourselves into that. But, you know, when you start to pull yourself into him and you start to enjoy him, and when you're seeking him, there's the rewards for that, the fruit of that. It becomes addicting. I don't know what other use, word to use. There probably are a lot of other words, but God is so amazing that you're going to get hooked. And you know, the Bible talks about, maybe some of us are more into the milk Christianity where we can just take a little 
little bit of God, the little sermon and a little pastor thing and a little blurb and a little scripture. We can't handle the meat of God's word. And the Bible says that we're to go from the milk to the meat, that we're able to handle the deep things of God. Otherwise, Hebrews chapter five, the end of verse, or into chapter five and into verse one of chapter six, it says, we're not able to tell the difference between good and evil if we're just on the milk. But the meat's where it's at. And the meat is, is where God is sharing the deeper truths with us. And so as he's saying that, then he's saying that there's this huge responsibility on us to have the right heart, the right intentions, to have the right energy and the right focus and the right willingness in our heart to hear from God. Expectation, anticipation. So he says, when he says seek, he says there has to be persevering. And notice in verse four, when he says searching out, that word means digging out as hidden treasure. So it's, we dig for that. And then in verse 5, so with that, then here's, here's where it all leads. This is good. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord. That's where it all leads. So our intentional, purposeful heart that is inclined and in desiring to know God will lead us to a proper understanding of God, which is the fear of God. And the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. All of wisdom is wrapped up in having a proper understanding of God. A proper understanding of God. That means to know Him personally. And you know what happens is then knowing him personally brings about the things that are written in his word. They're actually now part of us because we're being transformed by his word. Now we're walking freely on God's path because now we're so instinctually accustomed to his will and his way because now our, we have a proper relationship with God. That proper relationship with God is then to walk closely with him. Ultimately, that's what fearing the Lord does. Fearing the Lord means that we have a proper relationship with God. Now, I want to say a couple things about this. And if you're taking notes, I'm going to say a couple big words that you want to get. This is important. There's a understanding that we have to have about God that he's transcendent. If we, if we don't understand God's transcendence, we will not have a worshipful, passionate heart. Transcendence means that God transcends or is above and beyond anything we can think or imagine. One way to look at it is the bigness of God, the uncontainability of God. Another way to think of that is the otherness of God. He's so other than us, so ridiculously other than us. See, what happens is when, when we have a church community, a fellowship, that understands the transcendence of God, it creates this wonder within the worship, within the community. It creates a culture that there's this anticipation of, we don't have God all figured out yet. One of the greatest detriments to the transcendence of God is just having God all kind of boxed in and formulized and figured out. Job's counselors did that. They said, hey, Job, we don't know the whole story, but hey, you're suffering, so you must have done something, so repent. They couldn't think beyond that. 
And they went on and on and on. Have you read the book of Job? And on and on and on and on and on and on. You're like, shut up already. <laughs> and we know he didn't do that. And you're like, come on, just stop. See, there's, there's no worship there. There's no transcendence there. So that's the thing that he's, he's saying that if what will happen if we put ourselves into the pursuit of God, God transcends life. It transcends our boxes. It transcends our systems. It transcends all that we can. And, and we see this God that's bigger than everything. And the second word I'm going to use is the imminency of God. So the transcendence of God is the God's otherness, God's bigness, God's vastness, God's incomprehensibleness fully. And then imminence means that God is near. He's here. Why is that important? If we don't understand or believe in God's imminence, and we just think God's a the old man upstairs some far distant, oh, distance away that kind of wound things up and left us to ourselves. Then we will institute traditionalism, ritualism, and formal religion in the place of the presence of God. When you have a, tr a church community that understands the transcendence of God and the imminency of God, that this other, so other God is right here and he's near. What does that do? Hey, I can't wait to get to worship the Lord now. I can't wait to be in the presence of the Lord with my brothers and sisters who also are excited to be in the presence of the Lord. It changes everything. That's what he's saying here. He, he's saying as we, we, we incline ourselves to God, then we understand the fear of the Lord. And the fear of the Lord for a Christian shouldn't keep us away from the Lord. It should put us in all of the Lord and it should make us thankful for the Lord and it should make us want to be in his presence. Because he lets us, as big as he is, he lets us be in his presence. And one of the most damaging things that can happen to a church is a low view of God. Where God is made in man's image. And systems and rituals and programs and things are all put in the place of God. And now we just plug into the machinery. And we're doing all this Christian stuff and we're not even drawing near to God. God help us not to do that. So then he says in verse 5. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. That just excites me. God's saying, you can find the knowledge of God, the knowledge of the holy, the Bible says in another place. I want to ask you to consider making that your life's ambition. If you're daring enough. Who would do that? Better question is who wouldn't do that? Sorry, that gets me excited. Verse 6. Here's the promise. For the Lord gives wisdom. There's the promise. He gives it. Do you want it? Go after it. Make it your life. Because the Lord gives it. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. And he is a shield to those who walk uprightly. He's a shield to those who walk uprightly. How does that work? He's a shield to those who walk uprightly. So wisdom... Wisdom does something that, that keeps us safe, it says. So in this world, we have a, a lot of 
things that are very harmful, a lot of very destructive things. Walking in the path of God, there's, there's safety, there's harmony, there's goodness, there's purity there. And that doesn't mean we're in a fallen world. That doesn't mean nothing can ever happen to us that may not harm us. But as we're walking with the Lord, we know that anything that would come our way, that God would use that for his purposes. And he would never let something like Job come our way that wouldn't promote in the end, our goodness and our welfare. But the, think about this. Think about, so we're walking in wisdom. We're seeking God. We're close with God. Now imagine a world. I'm going to take one thing. Imagine how different the world is, would be, if we took God's wisdom on one thing. Fornication. What is fornication? Any inappropriate sexual relationship outside of a marriage between a man and a woman. Now we've just wiped out every sexually transmitted disease. We've wiped out every crisis pregnancy to an unwed mother. We've wiped out rape. We've wiped out homosexuality. We've wiped out, imagine a world like that. Do you think that would be an improvement? That one thing, just one thing. Imagine that. How about we take two things? How about we take out drunkenness and or illicit drug use? How different would the world be then? How many people would still be alive? How many people would still have their livers? How many people would be out of jail? How many people would be pr productive members of society? That's just two things of God's wisdom. That's two things that Satan uses tremendously in our world to hurt and harm and destroy people. Just two things. So in the face of all that, God says, walk this path, and maybe the world won't walk that path, but you can. You can be protected from those things. So that's how walking in wisdom works. So he says in verse 8, he says, He guards the paths of justice, and he preserves the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice, equity and every good path. He says, when wisdom enters your heart, notice the emphasis on heart. This is not just a head knowledge thing. This is a willingness, as we pointed out. This is a willingness and a transforming of our inner person. When wisdom enters your heart and knowledge is pleasant to your soul. That right there, I have found, is some of the richest experiences that a human being can have on earth. When God shares his knowledge, when he imparts his knowledge, when he imparts to us something, have you ever been in a message or been in prayer or you're having a devotional time at home, which I hope and pray you all do, and, the, and, and God shares some wisdom and it's just mind-blowing. What usually happens when that happens, you want more. But also, correct me if I'm wrong, you want to tell somebody about it. That's, this is what, see, this is important, guys. Listen, in our own personal time, our quiet time, our time with the Lord, God will We've just saw, he'll share that with us. He'll share his wisdom. He'll share insight, understanding. And I encourage you then to share that, to encourage and bless other people. I can't tell you how many times 
something I've read in the morning has come up specifically in that same day with somebody that I could share that same thing with and they, they get blessed. But here's the secret. Here's the secret. God shares with us one for us, two for others. One for us, two for others. And maybe you're saying, you know, I don't get excited about reading my Bible. It's, it's a pain. I don't like to. There's a lot of reasons for that. But one thing you have to understand, that will all change if you are intent on pursuing God and sticking with it. You'll get excited about it. You might have to press on a little bit. You might have to stick in there and persevere. But you will, the secret to being excited about God and meeting with God is by doing that, even though you may not feel like it. But see, maybe you've had too surf, uh, superficial of approach to it. And maybe you do flybys. Maybe you just, oh, I see one there. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> But, uh, <laughs> uh-huh, sure. Mm -hmm. No, I'm just kidding. But here's, here's what I mean, guys. If you're sitting here and you're going, gosh, am I the only one that I'm not excited about getting into the Word? And are there all these other people that, like, they're just into it? And we're, at one point in time, we're probably all like that. But we just thought the, the secret is doing it and getting into it. And, and there's a promise in that, that when God starts to reveal himself to us, it becomes addicting and we'll get fired up about God. But here's the second thing then is sharing that. There's, that's key. One, it's great if we have somebody specific we can share those things with. But two, in our everyday life, we might have opportunities to share it with people. But here's the thing. In Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. That's a description of what happens when we share what we're given. So I've found that so important because to whom um, much is given, much is required, the Bible says. See, that means that God shares these things with us. They're for us, but then they're for others too. So the, the sharing of the things of God then creates this river-like effect instead of this a lake effect where we continually have living water of God's wisdom and God's word coming through us and we're sharing it, we're getting more, we're sharing it. That's the secret of a lot of the people that you may listen to on the radio or you read their books. You're like, wow, how do they come up with that stuff? How do, because they're sharing it. They're seeking God and they're sharing it. That is so key, so important. And that's a healthy Christian lifestyle, right? That's what we do. We hear from God and we share it. We're built up and then we build up others with that. What a great way to use the things that God gives us, huh? To build up others. What if we had a, a life that's meditating on the word and we're like trees planted beside still waters and, and God is just giving us so much and we're sharing that and our minds are occupied with the things of the Lord and the promises of the Lord, and then we're sharing that and building other people up and they're encouraged, that's how it works. And that's where it's exciting. And that's where it's fun. And that's where there's awe. And that's where there's imminence and transcendence. It's all in just that little thing that we just talked about. So I think that's a good place to end tonight. So we take communion. I think that's important that we get a hold of that. Now remember, um, as you're putting away your Bibles, you may need them, but you may not. I don't know. But think about this. Last week I asked you, 
those who were who here, I asked you to write down something as we start the book of Proverbs. Write down how you want to be different at the end. You guys remember that? If you weren't here last week, take this opportunity out. If you have pen and paper or electronic advice, device, or if you, do, if you don't have anything, just remember it. Please write it down. Because as we start a new book, let's have a target. Let's each week come in here and let's focus on how we want to be different. Let's, let's, let's seek God with all of our heart and mind and soul and strength. But let's have a target. Let's pray that as we go through these studies, that God would transform us. And he'd make us different at the end. Let's pray against just the, the passive sitting and listening. Let's be all partakers of what God may want us to do. And a big part of that then is sharing, say sharing the things that we learned tonight. Sharing with somebody, what, what's my takeaways from tonight? What's the thing that God spoke to me about tonight? And then we're sharing those things. Then, it's, then it becomes rich and profitable and fruitful. Amen? So, how about, um, how about we pray, and then um, after we pray, we're going to have the ushers pass out the communion for us. Lord, thank you for your word tonight, and thank you for ministering to us so richly and deeply. And thank you for all that you've done in each of our lives, Lord. And so we have a time of communion. Lord, I want to ask that, that you would reveal and develop the things in our heart that we talked about tonight. Lord, I want to ask that we can just take a moment to reflect on how really great you are, how worthy of all of us, all of our being that you are. You're worthy of all that we have, Lord. And Lord, I pray that for any of us that we just are struggling, struggling to pour ourselves into you and to apply ourselves to you and seek you, I pray that tonight we just take a, a practical step of faith and first that we'd present ourselves to you as holy living sacrifices. And we would make a decision tonight if that's, that's what is on our heart, that we'd make a decision tonight that our life is going to be about knowing you. That you, God, are going to be our passion that you, God, are going to be our ambition. That we would seek you first, Lord, and trust you in all areas of our life, Lord. So I pray for anybody here tonight, if that tonight they can take a step of faith and say, Lord, tonight I choose to walk by faith. I give myself to you, just like Isaiah, when he said, here I am, Lord, send me. Just like Paul, Lord, when he said, what do you want me to do, Lord? So tonight as we contemplate and meditate what you've done for us, may we see the importance of giving our whole lives to you and then practically living that out, Lord. Let's continue in prayer, each one of us individually. We're going to have the ushers come around. They're going to pass out the communion. And please don't let any distractions take away from your communion with God. That's what it's all about right now. It's you communing with God. The highest blessing, the highest privilege that we can have is to know God personally and to worship Him. So hang on to the elements and we'll, we'll take it all together.